What's the latest in true crime? You get involved in a way that I think you don't with the fiction. And with the fiction, I'm always conscious of how the story is being told. Our columnist, Marilyn Stasio, is here to give you the real-life chills just in time for Halloween. Why did Dave Eggers turn to illustration in two new books out this fall? I know my limitations, and I was an, I was an illustrator and a cartoonist for a lot of years, but I wasn't very good most of that time. Dave will join us to talk about the power of pictures. Plus, we'll talk about what we and the wider world are reading. This is Inside the New York Times Book Review. I'm Pamela Paul. Our crime columnist, Marilyn Stasio, joins us now to talk about true crime. Marilyn, thank you for being here. Happy to be here. So you're still relatively new to covering true crime. I think this is your third true crime roundup for us. I'm going to go quickly over the titles, and then we can talk about the crimes. First up, and this is in no particular order, we have Death in the Air, the true story of a serial killer, The Great London Smog, and the Strangling of a City by Kate Winkler Dawson. You have to love the subtitles of true crime books. Um, (laughs) Then we have The 57 Bus, a true story of two teenagers and the crime that changed their lives by Dashka Slater. Mad City, the true story of the campus murders that America forgot by Michael Arnfield. Black Dahlia, Red Rose, The Crime, Corruption, and Cover-Up of America's Greatest Unsolved Murder by Pew Eatwell. The Death of an Heir, Adolf Coors III, and the Murder that Rocked an American Brewing Dynasty by Philip Jett. And lastly, Ballad of the Anarchist Bandits, The Crime Spree that Gripped Belle Epoque Paris by John Merriman. I'm tempted to just sit down and read all of these and, 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 and call that my Halloween. All right. Let's start with the one that I think had the most fun fact in it, and that is The Death of an Heir, Adolf Coors III, and The Murder That Rocked an American Brewing Dynasty by Philip Jett. My favorite fun fact from your review is that this poor son of the founder of Coors was allergic to beer. Yes, I love it. <laughs> and a stutterer to boot. So not an easy life and not a long life, as it turned out. What happened? What's the story of Adolf Coors III? Well, it's sad that he happened to have been the oldest child, the oldest boy, and was not the favorite. I mean, he was in a tough position to begin with. But he was very good about keeping up the brewery, and he went to work every day, and he was just very diligent. So these rotten crooks decided that they were going to kidnap him because, remember, this was the era or, you know, it was inspired by the Lindbergh kidnapping. And I think it was an accident. The way the author laid it out, it really sounded like they did not mean to kill him. But he fought back. And when he fought back, they killed him. So it was very sad. But I thought there was something kind of pathetic about him that he couldn't win his father's favor, even though he was the oldest. And he was trying so hard to please him. There was just something about that 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 talked to me, spoke to me. And it just seems more tragic for it. Well, how did it rock an American brewing dynasty? What happened in the wake of his death? Well, I can't say it fell apart because Coors Brewery is still, you know, right up there. But it destroyed the family. I mean, it was a tight-knit family. Mm -hmm. And even though he wasn't what his father wanted him to be, poor lad, nonetheless, he was the eldest child. Mm -hmm. And it just, I mean, it really had a terrible impact. And I think the point, in fact, I think I started with it, is the richer human to... And that's what this author manages to get across, that the rich are human and you can't think that they're they're somehow or other isolated from the same pains that you have. A few of the books that you looked at were sort of murder among the young. And I'm specifically thinking about uh, starting with The 57 Boss, a true story of two teenagers and the crime that changed their lives by Dashka Slater. What's the story? Such a heartbreaker that was. These two children shared the bus for about seven minutes of the day. Mm -hmm. They were coming from different schools and different parts of town and 
One was obviously from the upper classes and one was from the lower classes. And it was just a an intersection of barely seven minutes. But the the boy who did the deed was egged on by his friends to strike a match, or a lighter actually, mm -hmm. to this gauzy skirt that the rich boy was wearing. And he was wearing it because he was proud of being transgender, and he thought that was a nice expression, and his family was smart enough to say, do what you want to do. And he walked out in this fluffy skirt, and it went up in flames. Hmm. It was a time when, you know, those seven minutes, they could have met in so many different ways, but that it should have come to this end, and it was so violent, was just tragic. There's another story in here, too, again, a um, story about young people. Mad City, the true story of the campus murders that America forgot by Michael Arntfield. What's the story of this? Where does it take place? Oh, it's another sad one. I only pick sad ones. Where are the fun crimes, oh, Marilyn? There are They're no only in fun fiction. Crimes. <laughs> They're only this in fiction. This is sad because it's it was young women. Mm -hmm. They were in college, and they were best friends. And the one who had a room on the first floor mm -hmm. of her dorm was very concerned because she knew that she had a stalker or a peeper or whatever they called them who would stand outside her window. And she did tell the campus police. None of this was her fault. You know, you can't turn around and blame the victim and say, well, she didn't say anything. She didn't do that. Luckily, she told her friend, but it didn't stop her from getting killed. But it, what it did do was it just riled her best friend, who spent the next, what, 40 years tracking him down? Wow. Isn't that amazing? And why tell this story now? What's the contemporary relevance, if, if there is one? Nothing is ever put to bed. You never say, well, that's the last of the Lindberghs. Mm -hmm. No, it's not. It's never the last. But this was particularly kind of touching because of her fidelity. I mean, how many people are that? How many friends would do that for you? And I was thinking to myself, I almost asked a few friends, would you do that for me? If somebody, would you track down your killer for 40 years? Yeah, would you do that? Would you give up your whole life? Death in the Air, the true story of a serial killer, the great London smog, Ooh. and the strangling of a city by Kate Winkler oh, Dawson. Oh, that was so good. Ooh, ooh, okay, so, so good. we're in 1952 with this book. Well, that was the year that London was just burning all kinds of crappy coal. It was their dirty coal that they got. They sold their good coal abroad. So... Everybody is burning coal, and the stuff in the air is just a killer. It was really, literally, a killer fog. 4,000 people were asphyxiated, and many, many more were hospitalized. 4,000 people, and they're burning away. And in the middle of it, so that in itself is number right, one. Right, you don't crime. need a serial killer with oh, this situation. <laughs> Under cover of the smog mm -hmm. was Christie. That awful Reg Christie on, you know, 10 Rillington Place is sort of famous for being the home where Reg buried eight women that mm -hmm. he had lured to his house. And again, it was so cruel because he lured them, some of them, to his house by saying that he had this wonderful cough medicine against the smog. Hmm. It was just doubly cruel. And here they were coughing and hacking and coming to him, hoping to get this special cough medicine. He killed them and buried them in his garden, eight of them. How did they eventually track him down? Oh, he tripped up finally, and he was doing it in full view of the neighbors. He was burying them and waving to people as he's digging holes. And he said, I just, he said himself he couldn't get over it. He said, in fact, one of the things that was holding up his garden fence mm -hmm. was a human thigh bone, and no one seemed to notice. I'm wow. sorry, I'm laughing. This sounds terrible. 
Well, let's go to an unsolved murder. <gasps> um, and I think this sounds like this one was your favorite among the books. Black Dahlia, Red Rose, The Crime, Corruption, and Cover-Up of America's Greatest Unsolved Murder by Pew Eatwell. Oh, boy. That really just rang my bells, truly. It, I, I wonder why. I wonder if it's the portrait of her that's so very well known. She was so, so beautiful. I wonder how much that had to do with the fact that this is an unforgettable crime. All right. For those who don't remember this story, tell us the story. It's Los Angeles, 1947. Who was the woman who became known as the Black Dahlia? Her name was Elizabeth Short. And the story began with the discovery of her body. And I suppose I shouldn't really go into it, but part of it, uh, maybe the major part of the public fascination was that the body was horribly mutilated. And larger than that murder itself was the larger historical context. It was a time when young women and girls were just flocking to Hollywood, Mm -hmm. flocking. It was the end of the war, war over, guys coming home, girls suddenly not worried about their husbands, boyfriends, fathers, sons, and all that. They were, everyone was free. And they were into Hollywood wanting to be discovered. And they were so vulnerable. And people, you know, they didn't realize they were vulnerable, but they really were. So she sort of summed up more than any book that I have read, not that I'm deeply read in that whole period, but she really summed it up, that girl. Black Dahlia murders have been, there have been movies made about it. There have been books written about it. This is not a new subject. Does she uncover anything new in this book? She claims she knows who it is. I don't believe it. I mean, I have never read a book that made a good case to me. It's Jack the Ripper. People can't get enough of Jack the Ripper. And this is the American version of Jack the Ripper. Everybody seems to have a, an idea of who did it. It's not convincing. I'm mm-hmm. sorry. What is convincing is the context of the story, and that's what I like. I mean, the best thing about any crime, whether it's fiction or whether it's true crime, is that the story is folded inside something larger than itself. And if you look at these, each one of these stories, you know, individual, small, sad, human stories is wrapped inside something larger. Like Death in the Air was the terrible smog, Mm -hmm. and 4,000 people died. And if you're concentrated on, you know, one murder, or in this case, the Black Dahlia, you're concentrated on her. But she stood for so many other people. I mean, the girls were just coming from all over. I I really think that I want to read something about this. That, for one thing, the author calls her, says nobody had expected her to be so sullenly beautiful, Mm. which I think is a nifty piece of writing because it's true that that sullen, that face of hers is unforgettable. But as the author points out, it was a period when everybody wanted to go to Hollywood. And this is what, this is the way it was put. Tall girls and short girls, curly-haired girls, girls with their hair drawn starkly back over their brows, girls who suggest mignonettes, and girls who suggest tuberoses, girls in aprons and girls in evening gowns, girls by the score, their faces all grease paint, waiting in little chattering groups for their big moment. Well, she was called the Black Dahlia, but she seems like one of those the tuberose girls, doesn't she? <laughs> Another book, the last one among these, also I think is very much about the historical context, and that is Ballad of the Anarchist Bandits, the crime spree that gripped Belle Epoque Paris by John Merriman. It's not a very pretty story, is it? Oh, this no, one. but that's why we like it. <laughs> so who was the Bono gang? They were anarchists. And the the thing that made them stand out was that they were led by a couple who met on the barricade, so mm-hmm. to speak. And that gave it a little twist. For the most part, you think of anarchists as 
the creep who threw a bomb at the president, mm-hmm. you know, and the other creeps who just tore up some city or state and had everyone in a terrible frame of mind. You know, it was just awful, anarchy, anarchy. But this was romantic. This gave a little jolt to mm-hmm. the notion of anarchists, along with Stephen Sondheim, who uh, liked anarchists. And I don't think there's anything terribly appealing about anarchists, but lovers? Lovers are always appealing. And that's what made this stand out. You reviewed six books. I think it sounds like your favorite was Black Dahlia, Red Rose. How can you tell? Your enthusiasm shows through, but you make all these books sound good. So if we could just do a quick run through and maybe just say sort of the best thing about each. And let's go back to the beginning. We talked about the death of an heir. This is the one about the murder of the eldest child in the Coors family. And the heir of this great brewing house. And the family. I think what is touching about that is that even though they were very, very rich, you know, just sickeningly rich, he was the oldest son. And there is something so devastating about a murder that destroys a family. The 57 bus, also a very destructive, sad story, Dashka Slater's story about two kids in a hate crime in Oakland. Children do the most outlandish things when they're so young, and judges should not send them to jail for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just not proper. Minors are minors. They're children. It was an accident. You don't ruin someone's life. Another story about young people, Mad City, the true story of the campus murders that America forgot by Michael Arndfield. Well, what is really upsetting and uplifting about that book, that story at the same time, is that these two best friends went to the same college, and one of them was murdered, but she had mentioned that she was being stalked to her best friend, and the police could not solve the murder. So the best friend spent 40 years of her life tracking down the murder. So it's a story about friendship. Absolutely. More than anything else. All right. Ballad of the Anarchist Bandits, we've got, I'm assuming, the Belle Epoque Paris setting. That's it. That's it. (laughs) Um, And then um, Death in the Air by Kate Winkler Dawson about the London smog in 1952. I love that book, yeah. I really love the book. A good, solid story, and then a bigger story wrapped around it so that one death or one person's story really reflects something larger than itself. And the fact that this all takes place within the great London smog of 1952 is what really got to me. All right, Marilyn, your main gig here at The Times is as our crime columnist of longstanding, but what do you get out of true crime books that you don't get in fiction? That's a very interesting question. I'm not sure. I think part of it is it's almost scarier Mm -hmm. because fiction is fiction. And when you put it down and when you pick it up, you're constantly aware that it's a story. It's when we go to a movie and it's horrifying and you keep saying, it's only a story, it's only a movie, it's only a book. No, it's not. It's real. It really happens. So there's a sense of immediacy to it. You get involved in a way that I think you don't with the fiction. And with the fiction, I'm always conscious of how the story is being told, Mm -hmm. you know, the construction. But that's in a professional capacity. I do that when I'm reading true crime. I'm not thinking that way. I'm just reading for the story. Well, that's interesting, but it's more for the story and the nonfiction in a way than, than in the fiction. And a very appropriate time to review this, of course, is Halloween. So happy Ooh. Halloween, Marilyn. Thank you, my favorite holiday. <laughs> Thanks so much for being here. Dave Eggers joins us now from San Francisco to talk about two books that he has coming out this fall. Dave, thanks for being here. Thank you, Pamela. So these are two very different books. I think that you have a novel coming next year. Is that right? Yeah, there's um, a lot of stuff kind of ended up getting stacked within about a year time frame. And uh, even though some of these things were done 
years ago. But yeah, the first one is uh, Her Right Foot, a, a picture book about the Statue of Liberty I wrote a few years ago and, and happens to be uh, just came out, I guess, this week. So this is a picture book. It's a children's book, although enjoyable for all ages, with art by Sean Harris. The other book is also a picture book, but more an adult picture book, a kind of art book, and that is called Ungrateful Mammals, which is coming out in October. And the novel next year, and I'm hoping that you're, you'll say there's like a TV show and a movie or something in here too, so that it'll just be like a full season of Dave Eggers in all formats. Nothing but the books. But yeah, there's a a book in January called The Monk of Mocha, but that's nonfiction. And then uh, and then a, a book for middle grade uh, comes later on. It it seems, uh, yeah, like a lot in a short span, but some of these things were finished so long ago, it's just that strange pace of publishing sometimes where it's a few years sometimes between when you're done and when it appears and suddenly uh, you have to re-enter that world. Well, in the case of Her Right Foot, that actually was intended to come out later, but was moved up for reasons of timeliness, because this is a book that I think has an important and timely message. Can you tell us about Her Right Foot and how that came to be? Yeah, you know, this was actually, I mean, the text was written for this two years ago, after I visited Statue of Liberty in Liberty Island, in Ellis Island, in the middle of winter. A couple years ago, it was cold and wet, and I was on a ferry with my family and hundreds of other families, and we were all soaked and cold, but it was actually really fun, you know, like, it was kind of, uh, we were the huddled masses in this cold, wet boat, but we sort of had, you know, dozens of languages being spoken, but everybody, there was a real camaraderie, I think, maybe shared suffering that day in the in the rain, but during that trip... I noticed for the first time, because you're, if you're on a ferry looking up at the statue, you're looking up at the bottom of her foot. And um, her right foot, you realize, is in mid-stride and that she seems to be walking off the pedestal. And I think that we always picture the Statue of Liberty standing stock still. And the fact that she was seemed to be walking and striding even seemed to me really symbolic of fact that the country and what the Statue of Liberty stands for is, a, is an ongoing thing. It's an active thing, kinetic, and that we can't do what we think the Statue of Liberty was doing, which is standing still and uh, in, a, you know, in a state of stasis, I think, uh, especially with all the rhetoric around immigration and anti-immigration rhetoric, I felt like it was an important time to remind I saw what the statue stands for. One of the things I like about the approach that you take in this book is that you seem to connect the artist choices with the symbols and then to our history and to where we are right now in terms of those themes of immigration and refugees. Yeah, I mean, first of all, we got to remember that the Statue of Liberty itself is an immigrant. You know, she's an immigrant. She's made by a Frenchman of Italian descent and with Eiffel, who designed the interior, and it was a cross, you know, American-French collaboration, and that, you know, the money for the statue didn't come from the government. It was all privately raised, a lot of it by Joseph Pulitzer, who had to sort of solicit penny and dime and dollar donations from hundreds of thousands of people to make it possible, mm-hmm. which I think is so such a beautiful thing and in itself, that it wasn't just some you know, federally mandated or funded thing. It's just like so much of what we do in this country. It's sort of volunteer-based. the people statue. Yeah. You know, the history of this statue is so in keeping with what it, you know, what it has come to symbolize. And I think we are at a critical stage where there are factions, and I, I believe that they are very small, fanatical, fringe and historically amnesiac factions that forget that we're a nation of immigrants and that we have accepted the Statue of Liberty as a symbol of welcome and not just welcome that ended in 1912, but a symbol of welcome that is ongoing. And that if 
we are Americans, as by nature, we are welcomers. And, and we can't forget that. And if we don't want that, or if we want us to be a country with closed borders on all sides, then we're no longer Americans. You talk about in the book how the symbol of the torch and the crown and the robes and, you know, all of this has sort of been discussed, but you call your book Her Right Foot for a reason. What is it that people don't notice about the Statue of Liberty's right foot? Well, like I was saying, the the fact that she's in Mm mid-stride. She is not standing still. And I take that to mean that, you know, not only at the base of the of the statue is sort of a little intertwined broken chains that uh, she has broken through with her striding foot to symbolize the end of slavery and, and bondage for all of those who have come to the U.S. fleeing oppression. But the fact that she's not only standing there welcome, but she's actually walking out to sea to meet, I think, you know, new arrivals halfway to say, we're not just going to open the door once you get here, but we're going to help you um, through that door because you've been through all that you've been through. I think it's the least that we can do. I, I, I think that we have to recognize that immigrants are the bravest people among us. Those of us that were born here into comfort and freedom from oppression have to, I think, recognize the courage and the inner steel of people that give up everything and sacrifice everything and make these arduous journeys here. These are not people to look down on or to be suspicious of necessarily. Um, These are people that we need to honor and welcome and, and give them the same opportunities that our forebears were given, whether they came from Sweden or Ireland or Mexico or Africa, even though we've just had a modified travel ban, this is a historically anomalous period where, or I guess we've had periods before where we've decided that we didn't want certain immigrants, whether it's Chinese or Irish or you name it. We do this over and over and always at our peril and always sacrificing what makes us Americans and what makes us good. Right now, we're in a period where we sound afraid, Mm -hmm. we sound un-American, and we sound prejudicial, and it's very embarrassing, and it's very antithetical to who we are. This is not your first children's book, and it follows your your last children's book, which was about the Golden Gate Bridge. So you have on either side of the country two monumental works that are heavily symbolic— One of the things I was interested in is that in both cases, you chose not to illustrate the books yourself, even though, and we'll talk about your other new book, Ungrateful Mammals, in a few minutes, but even though you are an accomplished artist in your own right, did you think about illustrating them yourself? Not really. I I know my limitations, and um, I I was an illustrator and a cartoonist for a lot of years, but I wasn't very good most of that time. And I can't do what Tucker Nichols did with uh, This Bridge Will Not Be Gray, and I can't do what Sean Harris did in illustrating Her Right Foot, which is just coming up with beautiful, very compositions for each page, each spread, mm-hmm. and rendering anything that they want to render incredibly well. I, I was classically trained to draw people, to draw, I guess, animals, certain things. I just don't have the... Uh, the varied toolbox, I guess, that those guys have and professional illustrators have. I I have a limited range of skills, and right now it's mostly limited to drawing mammals and uh, other living creatures and then writing ridiculous text around them. <laughs> Well, in Ungrateful Mammals, I have to say, you you do, I think you allude to the fact that you you push that definition, that word mammal, because the one I'm looking at right now is actually of of a spider, and the label is not much of a joiner. So can you talk a little bit about this book and the origins and to what extent it's about mammals? Well, you know, I've been drawing since I was four or five, and most of what I drew from most of that time were... uh, mammals and monsters and animals of some kind, creatures. And 
I did some of this kind of stuff in college, and I did it after college. And then somewhere maybe 10 years ago, I got in touch with a gallerist named Noah Lang here in San Francisco who had seen some of these drawings, and he offered me a show at his gallery, uh, Electric Works, and Scholar Match, our college access group, had just started up, and I thought, well, maybe if we could sell this work and make some money for Scholar Match, it would justify the inherent ludicrousness of my doing these things. And so started that, and we've been doing it for 10 years now. And drawing these things is the most fun I have in a given day, I would say. And it's a lot more fun than sitting in my garage trying to write prose. And it's a good palate cleanser at the end of the day because I tend to draw at night. And then it gets me back to my art school days and it exercises the uh, ludicrous part of my brain and they make me laugh from time to time. And then we periodically show them, like we have a show in about a week here in San Francisco where we'll put up a few hundred of these and and uh, in this case, they'll be in record racks. Like mm-hmm. uh, it'll, it'll look like you're going to a record store and you can flip through them. And then if you buy them, they go toward uh, college scholarships and college counseling. And I'm, I'm sitting in the office as a scholar match right now. You know, we've been able to raise quite a bit of money uh, for scholar match over the years. So it all it all works out. But the fact that Abrams, you know, with its august history this is like a publishing company i knew of when i was about 10 because all i read at that age were art books i didn't read book books really when i was that age i always went into the library checked out you know books about manet or uh renoir you know my favorite artists at the time and i would just look at the pictures and so the fact that they deigned it possible or lower themselves to publishing my drawings is really uh beyond my imagining, but it's it's a great honor. I, I still can't believe uh, that it happened, and I'm holding that book in my hands. It looks like you had fun working on this. The two books, again, are Ungrateful Mammals and a children's book, Her Right Foot, both by Dave Eggers and Her Right Foot with illustrations by Sean Harris. As you mentioned earlier, you have a nonfiction, more narrative book coming out next year. But for now, two illustrated picture books, very different from Dave Eggers. So Dave, thank you so much for being here. Thanks a lot, Pamela. Good to talk to you. This is John Williams, and I am joined by three of my colleagues this week to talk about what we're reading, Jennifer Salai, Greg Coles, and our special guest this week, Gal Beckerman. So let's start with our guest. Gal, what do you have in hey, front of you? Hey, I'm reading a, a comic novel that came out earlier this year, I think in the summer, by Matthew Clam. It's called Who is Rich? And this book has had the distinction for me of being a book that I find, like, incredibly depressing, <laughs> but that has, like, laugh-out-loud elements on like every page good combo seriously i can't remember a reading experience like that that is it's about a guy who's in a a guy who's a cartoonist the whole book takes place over a week that he's at an arts conference where he's teaching a a course on on cartooning and he's like in complete full-blown midlife crisis mode and so and the book is a is a is very much a satire of the kind of world of kind of writers and artists and kind of the, the pettiness and the jealousies that come out when you get them in a in a room together. It's, it's a satire of us, basically. It's basically a satire of us. But I mean, maybe that's, maybe it's so funny to me for that reason. <laughs> and depressing. Um, but it's also got a real class element to well, it. Well, that's what I, I was going to get to that, that the big kind of central Part of the plot is that he's having an affair with this very, very rich woman who was an attendee at this conference. The affair started the year before, and this is now the the year he's come back and they've met up again. But all of their exchanges are like infused with this class element. Every interaction he has with her in a hundred different ways, like this awareness of their difference in class comes into play. I mean, he's like this you know, lower middle class guy who's trying to make it as an artist. He had like one book that came out that had him like a little bit of fame like nine years before and it's very much faded and he he's, part of the book is also interesting for that it, it focuses on on how, you know, what it's like to be, to actually try to balance parenting and being an artist. And, but the class element is, is quite interesting only because it feels original, you know, in, in that I, you don't read a lot of these types of books that take 
so much attention uh, on that. I wonder which part makes you cry, the art stuff or, or the uh, well, just wealth stuff. the level stuff. of his of his of his <laughs> crisis. I mean, he's like he's got this family at home that he like loves but can't stand at the same time and you know, he hates himself for this affair that he's having, but you can see that's the only bit of like happiness that he has in his life Jeez. and it's like it's, it's We should say that it's an affair for her too. She's married oh, yeah, to like a, a hedge fund she's billionaire. She's married to this like hedge fund billionaire. It's, he also mocks this world of like you know, there's the people who like run the conference and they're like, they're a weird, com- you know, you can see these weird amalgams of actual real life characters. Are you they know. thought leaders? <laughs> yes, they're, they're thought leaders. There's a lot of TED Talks and like, and and just the, the micro focus on like the kind of food that they're feeding them and, and the way it's just, it's, it's, it's brilliant. I, I want to read that, but. Greg, Greg read it earlier this year. I did. I, I read it over the summer, and um, I'm lagging behind Ma- you guys. And Matthew Clam was the author of an earlier story collection that was like 15 years ago right. or something right. called right. The, right. Sam the Cat, right. and uh, really great, funny stories, very lively. Also, I mean, v- very similar to this right. book in a way. In fact, I, I think this novel maybe even grows out of one of the stories in that book. I, I can't remember. It's been a long time since that story collection. He might not be able to remember. Yeah. <laughs> you also can't long. you can't help but wondering, you know, what autobiographical elements exist here. And and in the book itself, there's many moments where he suddenly has a, you know, realization that he should turn this horrible experience and these horrible feelings that he's having into a new comic, you know, like, right. so, so he's, which, so you wonder whether he's doing the same type of thing with the novel itself. Greg, any class issues in what you're reading this week? <laughs> there, there are some class issues, as a matter of fact, I'm, I'm continuing my, um, just kind of pure escapist reading. You'll remember a few weeks ago on the podcast, I talked about a, um, science fiction book that I really enjoyed a lot called The Power by Naomi Alderman. Uh, I, continuing in the genre thread, I'm, I'm now reading a horror novel called The Dark Net by Benjamin Percy, a novelist. I've, I've liked his earlier work. It, it's ranged pretty pretty widely. He's done werewolf novels, right. Red Red Moon, and um, he kind of came to the I horror stuff after he, a couple he, of a, after more traditional his literary his more literary books, stuff. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, wow. I say more literary, hey. but he he's very much <laughs> a literary novelist, even in his genre work. He's uh, I, I on almost every page there's an image that stops me or or the language he writes this very muscular prose it's I, I was saying to somebody yesterday he, he has great verbs <laughs> I'll often stop and they go oh that was like kind of a surprising great you know it's it, the, the verbs do a lot of work in this book and he's uh, I mean he's clearly a thoughtful and talented writer putting those talents um, in the service of a purely supernatural kind of horror thriller here demons. The, the book is called The Dark Net. It looks at this world of the dark web where with bitcoins and Tor and where people do drug deals and hitmen and you know, but it imagines that kind of the demons, the the hell spawn, um, are using that to their own ends. Um <laughs> <Wow>. to <laughs> it seems very believable to me. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> to try Maybe to take over Portland. <laughs> I feel exactly. like even the well lit web is <laughs> run by demon spawns mostly. Right. Just uh, the, the class <laughs> stuff is actually pretty under the surface here. One of one of the characters runs a homeless shelter. Uh, right. he's a character who's a former evangelical speaker, made a lot of money as when he was like six years old. He 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 died briefly and came back. And so it's mm-hmm. like these people who write these books about heaven is real and, right, and right. stuff like that. This is a character clearly modeled on that kind of person. And one of the demons is a freelancer having trouble making ends meet. <laughs> <laughs> Several of them. Okay. <laughs> is no, this a and- brand new book? It is a brand new book. Our review of it has just come out. Terrence Rafferty reviewed it in his horror Quite column. Positively. That was the, yeah. the one book that kind of emerged from that. Roundup. Again, Percy's an interesting writer, kind of playing with interesting ideas in this. I'd I'd like to say it's purely escapist, but I actually have the excuse I am reading it for work because he'll be on a panel that I'm moderating at the Texas Book Festival next month. And and so I'm reading it in preparation for that, but with no complaints at all. I'm, I'm anything really anything with it. really great verbs is not purely escapist. <laughs> Jen. So for me, I'm Finishing up a book that I started talking about last week, which is The Orchid Thief by Susan Orlean. The impetus for her article for The New Yorker from which this book grew is this character named John LaRoche, who is the orchid thief in the title. So the first part of the book, I thought it was really going to be just like a longer version of what would be a profile of him and about him and how he's connected to the world of orchids. 
And it's sort of that, but then it becomes much more about the world of orchids in general. So she collectors goes collectors, and... hunters, because they're called hunters, because a lot of times, at least in the past, it was very difficult to actually find these flowers in order to bring back the they seeds grow to cultivate in the them. swamps. And grow they're... in the swamps and dangerous, yeah. very dangerous parts of the world in terms of sort of natural dangers. And so she just meets all these characters who are totally devoted to the world of orchids. And so he is the kind of guy who he goes from obsession to obsession, <laughs> and he's moved into the world of internet pornography. Like he's working for companies, putting together their websites, but has also found a way to make money. So now I'm right at the very end and he has agreed, even though he's renounced the world of orchids, he's agreed to try to help her actually see a ghost orchid. You know, she spends a lot of time in Florida getting to know these people and she expresses this awe for how committed they are to this world of orchids. <laughs> And how they give up so many other parts of their life in order to pursue this passion and how she feels drawn to it. But also part of that is because she doesn't quite understand it. Mm. So it's just it's I, I really recommend it. And when I was actually when I was reading it on the subway the other day, a woman came up to me and was like, that is so good. That book is mm. so so good. And I feel like that doesn't happen that often no. on the subway. So <laughs> not sure that's yeah. ever happened to me. So. Well, are you reading anything you that will stop people on the subway now, John? I don't think so. I don't <laughs> think you know, I, I don't think anyone on the subway has heard of these. They might well, say, How do you pronounce that yeah. name? <laughs> <laughs> and, and as listeners will realize, I could not help them, but I'm gonna do my best. Um, I'm actually I, I was on vacation last week and so I've had some time, but I really I didn't read much. I read the you'll see that these two books in front of me are fairly short. And I've only read one of them, and, and I'm starting the second. The one I read is a novel by a Danish writer named Jens Peter Jacobsen, and the novel is called, named after its protagonist, Niels Lynn, N-I-E-L-S, and then L-Y-H-N-E. So any Danish listeners can call in and correct me. It's from the late 19th century. It's from a time when religion and science were really clashing. There's a classic memoir by a guy named Edmund Goss called Father and Son, which is one of my favorite books. And it it echoes that a little bit in the way that this character kind of moves away from his family's traditional religious beliefs. And he's an aspiring poet who kind of strikes out on his own. There's a series of relationships he has in the book, which are with, you know, women of varying ages. And, you know, some are romantic, some aren't. But he, he sort of loses these women one after another, which is the common thread I see in the book. And, you know, he adores them on varying levels. So he's, he's constantly sort of disillusioned and then building back up his romantic ideals and then having them crushed again. It's a great book. I mean, it's published by Penguin Classics and it has a lot of the kind of, there are some, you know, romantic declarations that reminded me of Jane Eyre, like these moments of, you know, passion that people really articulately spew to each other. And I would highly recommend it. And, and the reason I went to it is because Yale University just published the first English language biography of the author Jacobson called A Difficult Death. And that's by a New York-based writer named Morton Hoy Jensen, J-E-N-S-E-N. -E so I'm just sort of 40 pages into that, enjoying it, and I'll probably... Uh, Hopefully, talk about it a little did, bit. Next did you week. write about him recently in your open book column? Yeah, the. I mean, am I right in thinking that Jacobson died young and and therefore isn't as well known as he might have been? Yes, he died at thirty eight of tuberculosis, and he only wrote, I think, two books or at least two novels. And uh, Niels Lynn was the second of them. It's still the best known. And the biography has a foreword by James Wood, the literary critic, who's a big fan. Rilke and other people were huge fans when he when he was alive. He was a really big deal, yeah, especially right. in European and literature. And and uh, Wood makes the point that he's still sort of Scandinavian canon. You know, this is like a really important novel there. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad to have read it. But again, it was kind of paltry for a vacation. It wasn't much. I usually try to pack <laughs> four or five books and get through them. But this was this kept my attention the whole time. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thanks John. John. Remember, there's more at nytimes.com slash books, and you can always write to us at books at nytimes.com. Inside the New York Times Book Review is produced by Pedro Rosado from Headstepper Media. Thanks for listening. For the New York Times, I'm Pamela Paul. Pamela Paul.